Hi, this is Matt McCormick at the in the philosophy department at California State University, Sacramento. This is my uh, third lecture on functionalism for my philosophy of mind class, which is uh, philosophy uh, philosophy 153, and we've been talking about functionalism. And today's lecture, I'm going to give you um, a short account of some famous objections to functionalism. So, functionalism, you will recall, is this view that the best way to understand mind, the best way to define mind, is a way that abstracts away from the particular details of the way human brains happen to be built, the way terrestrial evolution happened to find um, a path to build minds, um, and it allows for extreme flexibility and allows us to define it on an abstract, a high level of abstraction, so that there's the possibility that some other sorts of systems, other Animals could have minds, even though they have very different brains than our own, or even possibly aliens or robots or uh, what have you. Uh, and the point here is to um, understand mind theoretically and not just give an account of how is the human brain built. That's the job for some neuroscience. Or that's the job for cognitive science. But the job for philosophy of mind is to come up with a theory of mind. What's, what's it take to be a mind? Humans are, have minds, clearly, and some other animals on Earth probably have minds. Um, but we want to understand a, a, a theory of what that is generally. Okay, so what happened is that most people um, who, uh, most philosophers of mind these days are functionalists. Uh, this position is the one that sort of holds sway and is the leading edge of uh, accounts of what minds are. Um, however, there's a set of problems, objections, questions that come up in the late 20th century that uh, pose very interesting, perhaps vexing uh, counterexamples counter or problems or objections to the position that need to be dealt with, that the functionalist needs to answer or provokes us to sort of understand the limits of what functionalism could be. So um, one of these is called the inverted qualia argument. Um, and I'm going to explain those today, and, and hopefully you'll see um, how they uh, generate a problem for functionalism, and then how they motivate the discussion to turn to this question of what qualia are. So, uh, a little bit of background. Humans have these orbs in their skulls that have a bunch of receptors that allow them to detect um, register, their cognitive systems can register, notice when certain kinds of electromagnetic radiation are, are present. You're getting bombarded with electromagnetic radiation from the full spectrum here all the time. There's gamma radiation, x-rays, ultraviolet, you know, f f uh, flooding into the room, uh, infrared, radio waves are passing through your body right now, and so on. But you don't have any uh, sense organs, there's nothing on your sensory periphery, there's nothing about your apparatus that will detect that. Uh, those just pass through unnoticed. But for a very narrow range, from about 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers wavelength, uh, we call that visible light because you've got these eyeballs in your head that can detect that. For that little range, that kind of EM radiation, that sets off um, that triggers or activates um, cells in your retina and sends signals cascading into your visual cortex. Now those signals get converted or translated or conducted into the system and the way they feel to you is that at the low end, the 400 nanometer range, they feel like purple and at the high end, they feel like bright red. So you've got sort of this confrontation here in this diagram with this fact that there's this objective scientific empirical phenomena happening out there in the world. There's this radiation that's spraying off of your sun, traveling 93 million miles and bombarding the surface of the earth. And when it gets to these, uh, to your eyeballs in your head, and then those signals register on those retina and transfer back into your visual cortex in the back of your brain and then conducted through the whole system, it feels a way so that meat has feelings, right? And you've got a very fairly narrow range. It's been expanded here, but you know you can make a, a, 
I think I recall somebody saying that people are capable of making a million color distinctions. Like within that range of 400 nanometers to 800 nanometers, you can make very, very fine distinctions between different shades and different hues. The others, you're completely blind to all of those. Okay, so that gets us thinking about these qualitative states within your system. This, this thing happening in the scientific world out there in reality that gets translated into a subjective phenomenal feel inside the system. Okay, so what's this term qualia we're talking about? Well, qualia is the qualitative subjective sense, the feeling you have when you look at that, when you have that particular, I forget the wavelength on that, um, this is down towards the 400 range, and the red is more up towards the 800 range. Those are feels. Qualitative, qualia is this, this notion, um, this idea of singling out the feel, the subjective feel that you have on the inside. And that's not something that's easily measurable. I mean, I, I'm assuming that you have them when you look at the screen, and I presume that that's going on inside the system for you, like it is for me. I just know I'm having those feels, and you're having them too. But it's inherently subjective, it's private, it's something that you can't, that no one else can get access to. So that's a qualia, and there's not much else I can say about it. That's just something you feel inside the system. Okay, so here's the thought experiment. Uh, imagine a person let's call him Smith, is born with a condition which makes his experience of wavelengths um, of the visible light spectrum as their opposite colors. Perhaps it's a genetic defect that, the, that has wired his eyes differently, maybe. Uh, you know, there's lots of different ways to sort of explain this, but the idea is going to be that he gets raised in a normal environment just like you. Maybe Smith is your brother, right? And like every other child, he learns all the same color terms by looking at a picture of a ripe apple. So a ripe apple looks different on the inside to Smith, but Smith learns to call that red just like you do. And Smith learns to associate ripe apple, uh, the ripe apple feel with that word red, even though inherently subjectively on the inside that feels different to Smith. And well-watered grass, when Smith looks at it, Smith learns to call that green even though it looks, it has a qualitative different subjective feel to him. And he looks at Lady Gaga's hair and says silver, just like you do. So he is able to make all the same color discriminations that you are, but on the inside, the subjective feel of that red object, if you were to have it, is what you'd call green, and so on. So when you both confront the same object, you both use the same word to describe it because you've made the same associations in English, but on the inside, the way it feels to Smith is the opposite of the way it feels to you. All right, so you got that. Imagine that Smith has inverted the whole system across the board in all ways. All right, so that means that Smith world, Smith's world looks like one of these to you, and your world, world looks like one of these to you. Now, the, the interesting problem here, of course, is that you don't know which one you are. You know that those two are different, and you know which one seems familiar to you, um, but you've got no other way to sort of parse that out. Okay, so here's a, here's a crucial question then. Could you and Smith figure it out? Could the two of you sort this out? If you were able to talk, um, if you were able to, to quiz Smith, Ask Smith all the questions you like. Point to all of the ripe bananas you want. Point to the sun. Point to the grass. Point to the, you know, um, uh, cut out, freshly cut open pineapple. Point to Big Bird. Point to whatever you want to point at. And Smith says, oh yeah, those are all yellow, right? Um, you point to a hundred objects and you ask him what color they are. And he says the same thing that you would have said. So, the question becomes, what externally manifest differences would could there even be here between the two of you? Like, is there any way for you to figure it out from the outside? And I think the way, the way the, the example is supposed to be designed, the way it's supposed to um, present a problem for us, is you're supposed to conclude the answer is no. There's nothing that you could do to figure out anything different between you and Smith. I mean, there might be some physical difference between you. You might be able to get down and look, do brain surgery at Smith and find a difference in wiring. 
But that's different. Like we're talking about the qualitative states. Is there anything, is, is there any access that another person can get to your uh, qualitative states? And it looks like the answer is no. And it looks like it maybe doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how it feels. It doesn't matter the particular character of the ripe banana or the big bird look. Um, uh, it doesn't matter what it is to Smith. It just matters that it's different than these other colors or that Smith can make the connection and notice that a ripe banana and big bird and a freshly cut open pineapple all are the same. But the, what that same is on the inside doesn't really matter functionally. That's going to be the crucial question here. Okay, so now a, a slight complication before I give you the argument. Um, and this is in, not sort of central to uh, the inverted qualia thought experiment, but what it does is it helps set us up for some other important stuff I want to say later, and it's relevant to the background. Um, it turns out that human color vision doesn't make uniform distinctions in hue across the full spectrum. That is, um, it's not as if uh, from that for that full range from 400 nanometers to 800 nanometers that you're equally capable of making the same gradations or distinctions between differences in hue across that range and the reason is is that you've got three different kinds of uh, receptors in your retina there's these blue blue ones, uh, blue receptors, uh, green receptors, and red receptors, I think is what they call them. And the distribution and the sensitivity uh, of the receptors for most people uh, is, or at least people's sensitivities map more or less onto this interesting uh, three um, uh, statistical distributions. That is, we get, we have very high sensitivity, we're very good for distinguishing blue at that peak on the first blue curve and we're very good at distinguishing green colors at that green peak we have a lot of receptors there and a very good at, at um, making the distinctions on the red curve and as those curves taper out to the bottom right and the bottom left we lose sensitivity and we start failing to be able to detect anything at all so once you get to the infrared spectrum or you get down to the UV spectrum uh, people can't you know you start showing them uh, exposing them to EM radiation that's in the UV range that's below the 400 nanometer range or above the 800 nanometer range and they say I don't see anything I don't know what you're talking about and and what they just they just get a they just get a sunburn at that point but that's 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 damage to their skin that's not a qualitative uh, subjective sensation that they can pick up with their eyes okay so here's the qual here's the problem we have blue green and red receptors in our eyes and each type is tuned to activate at different frequencies the activation range of the green and red receptors are close and overlap considerably that's where those two curves on the right um, uh, overlapped each other the activation range overlaps and the high density of receptors in that range gives us greater sensitivity the slight differences in hues there than with the B receptors so for that double curve on the right where the green and red receptors overlap you actually have twice as many receptors you've got green receptors that pick up on you know say at the 550 nanometer range and you've got red receptors that pick up there too so you have a lot more receptors and more receptors means um, more cognitive uh, work that you can do and finer distinctions and, uh, and gradations that you can tease out. So it turns out that when you show people very, very slight differences in hue between different yellows, for instance, they can tell you, okay, that one's different from that one, and that one's different from that one, even when you make very slight changes. But if you show them deep blues or purples and you change the hue a little bit, they're less sensitive to that, and they go, oh, that just looks the same. Now, there's some people who that varies for, and there's even reported cases of someone who has another kind of receptor. I should dig that out for this lecture. I think there was a case of a woman who has another kind of receptor, maybe it was a genetic defect, that actually gave her sensitivity out in further out the range into part of the EM spectrum that other people can't see. Um, which raises this sort of extraordinary question of what does that feel like? Like, what does that look like? What does a deeper red than red feel like to somebody who has those receptors? Or what does a different purple, a deeper purple than purple looks like to her? Something to be invisible to the rest of us. I mean, presumably that, that you know, that UV or something is somewhere in that range. 
I'll look up that case. Okay, so I, I bring that up to point out that um, were you and Smith to be inverted, um, this asymmetry or this unevenness in uh, sensitivity to colors, uh, because a normal person has a higher sensitivity at one end of the range than the other, so you've got a lopsided sensitivity. So were you to invert uh, Smith from normal color vision, that sen presumably that sensitivity would be inverted too. So Smith, I guess, would now be um, really good, depending on how we make Smith inverted, might be really good at making fine distinctions in purples and less good at making fine distinctions in yellows. Uh, so there's a wrinkle that advocates for the inverted qualia argument against functionalism might have to explain or they might have to work out. Now notice there's another thing going on here that in philosophy they use this thing they call them a thought experiment. This is a thought experiment um, which makes real scientists snicker. But what we mean by thought experiment here is that we are imagining this case. We're imagining that Smith has somehow been um, tinkered with or altered or changed. And it seems like it's a conceivable, possible, uh, it's not a problematic scenario we're imagining. And we're wondering now, what are the philosophical implications of this scenario we're imagining that we conceived of? And it seems like in lots of cases of thought experiments, and we're going to run into a bunch more of these in the course, it seems like for a lot of thought experiments that the case raises a really interesting problem for a real theory. So that our actual theory of what a mind actually really is, um, is impacted by the thought experiment where we conceive of some, you know, bizarre science fiction scenario. And you'll see more of those examples soon. Okay, so here's the argument. Um, the idea then is that if functionalism is correct, that is, if functionalism tells us a full account of what it is to have a mind, and it's all about the inputs and the outputs and the internal causal states, then two conscious systems that are in the same functional states would be in the same mental states. And this is just to say that what functionalism claims to be is it claims to be a theory of mind. And it claims to account for what minds are. So it says that to have a certain kind of mental state is to be in a certain sort of functional state. Okay, so that's just what functionalism is. It's an account of inputs and outputs, the comings and goings, and the different causal relationships between mental states. But we've just conceived of and explained in seemingly a completely coherent way of two conscious systems, inverted qualia Smith and somebody else like you, presumably like you, that's not inverted qualia Jones. And they're in the same functional state, but they're not in the same mental state. That is, we've imagined Smith and Jones who are able to both completely function, using their term in their normal sense, they, you, you walk Smith and Jones through the produce aisle at the grocery store, and they both can make all of the distinctions they need to make. They can both shop perfectly well for bananas and distinguish ripe from non-ripe, and they can um, find all the things they need to find in the grocery store, and they have indistinguish indistinguishable functional equivalents. Like the two of them are fully possessed of functioning minds that can do the inputs and outputs. They can name all the colors they need to name. They can do all the things they need to do in the world. And the, and Smith's differences, whatever they are, resist all of our attempts to try to reveal or expose it. So they're completely functionally equivalent. But by our hypothesis, they're not in the same mental states. Smith is feeling something different, like the qualitative state what's going on inside for Smith by hypothesis is different than what's going on for Jones. So that scenario then seems to undercut or uh, reject the very notion of functionalism explaining mind because it looks like functionalism accounts for function but it doesn't explain perhaps the most important part about being a mind is having feelings, is having internal qualitative states, things going on inside. Like, sure, we've explained the inputs and the outputs, and we explain, explained on this sort of mechanical way um, how it is that a mind functions in the world, but we haven't said anything about what it is to, to, to taste the flavor of wine, to um, uh, uh, experience the, the, the rich, lush green of a, 
of a you know a, a freshly mown grass, um, you know all of the things that make having a, a, a mind the most extraordinary and most stunning. Right, the the question we started with, that you have these, that the world gets rendered into fields on the inside hasn't been touched. Functionalism hasn't had a word to say about why it is it feels the way it feels. Okay, so put it another way, it's conceivable that two people could have inverted qualia from each other. That's what we just did. Since it's conceivable, nothing about the physical or functional configuration of the brain seems to determine or make the feels feel the actual way that they do. Red qualia could be attached to different functional states, and the person would be good to go and just as, uh, just as functional, just as equivalent. Um, therefore, the phenomenal facts must be something over and above the merely physical or functional. And what these objections do is they seem to bracket out a whole class of facts or something, um, phenomena that's going on subjectively for you that, that are untouched by the theory. So the suggestion is that the theory might be good as far as it goes, but it doesn't get to and it doesn't explain mind, or doesn't explain something about what's most important about minds. Therefore, the physical functional facts cannot be the complete story about the mind. It is in some regard non-physical, or there's something that can't be rendered by, and I've included physical because of physicalism is another theory we're going to talk about soon. Um, and the argument is said to work against physicalism too. Um, the idea is that uh, there's something about having a mind that cannot be captured by functional, functional or physical facts. So it's almost like in a, in a strange way, we've had um, a Cartesian dualism resurrected. Now, it's not to say that we've got that, that there are immaterial uh, souls or immaterial minds out there like Descartes thought. But this is a new kind of dualism. These arguments are said to motivate a new kind of dualism. And it's just to say that physical facts or functional facts, that's one thing. But then there's something else about mind that can't be captured by physical. So we've got a dual account. We have to have a dual account. We have to explain the phenomenal and we can explain the physical. Okay, so that's where these head. So there's several problems or responses that uh, defenders of functionalism have come back with that I'm just going to hit really quickly and we'll have time to think about these later. Um, one response might be to say, look, the fact that something's logically possible or the fact that something seems to be conceivable, which is what we did with Smith, we imagined, you know, you, what the functionalists might now do is just start, go back and pound away at this, this claim that we conceived of Smith. We seem to have conceived of it, but what does that mean? What did we actually do there? And the, the functionalist might say, well, look, that it's logically possible or that it's conceivable doesn't really imply anything about the real possibilities or what's empirical or what actually happens in physical systems. Um, and you'll see what this means later when we get to uh, some of the other theories. No explanation in science ever meets the standard of deductively ruling out all the other possible outcomes. Physical laws themselves aren't logical laws. And my idea here is this. this. Look. Um, to give a fully comprehensive physical explanation of something never precludes you imagining some other bizarre contra-physical state of affairs. You know, there's a, uh, I always think of the Simpsons episode where Homer gets a time travel toaster and he keeps using it to go back into time and change history and then coming back to the present and seeing the results. And all these weird things unfold. He goes back and accidentally kills the dinosaurs. And um, and then he comes back to the future and it's raining donuts. And there's all these like weird, uh, physically impossible things that happen. Well, look, um, we can imagine those. We can conceive of those, even though they're physically impossible. It's physically impossible to rain donuts, but it's logically conceivable. So the fact that I can conceive of something doesn't bear on what's physically true. That's what this is getting at. And I'm going to have some more time to explain that later in the semester. Um, it's also, some people have argued that it's not obviously true that inverted qualia cases are naturally possible. We've acted like such a thing could happen. It's just a matter of like rewiring Smith's brain. But it might be that such a thing actually can't work like that. It's just not as readily it's not, it maybe it's conceivable, but it's not as readily possible as we thought. Um, 
there's a it might be that there is a direct causal relationship between the brain and sensation so we'd expect we would expect premise one to be false might be one way to react to the argument i'll let you think about that some more the evidence suggests that there could not be such a difference in the subjective fields without a detectable difference in the structure or functional organization some people have also said um okay Another, a couple other interesting functionalist responses. Um, these ones get more um, traffic or get more attention. Uh, bite the bullet response. The functionalist might just say, nope, Smith and Jones are in the same mental state. It seems like there would be a difference between their worlds as they see them, but that's just an illusion, a product of a vague, simplistic, or misleading hypothetical scenario. I think this might be a response like Daniel Dennett gives. Um, that actually what they're going through subjectively is not different the way you think it is. It's just a product of the example that makes it seem that way. Or some people have actually said, look, qualia don't matter. They're not important. We don't have to explain them. Some functionalists have acknowledged that there are such things as qualia, but whatever they are isn't vital or essential to defining what consciousness is. Now, I've built this up as if you can't get away with that. Um, but there's a way of rendering all of this to go, yeah, there's qualitative states, but they don't have this sort of magical ontological status that we've made them out to have. The fields are one thing, the representational, epistemological, and causal roles are another. Okay, so uh, that's a quick pass through uh, what's actually a huge literature of people talking about inverted quality of thought experiments that are said to give a serious objection to reductionist, physicalist, or functionalist accounts of mind. Uh, I'll leave it at that for today, and we'll consider, uh, a, a, we'll have one more lecture, one more discussion about functionalism before we move on to some of the other theories.